Um, uh, it's my pleasure to get to be a, a, a part of this. Uh, also, by way of plugging the book festival, two sessions in particular that I think um, if you get a chance, you should check out that I, I'm particularly attached to. Um, one is with um, uh, Seeley McInnes, Charlie Braxton, uh, and Kiese Lehman talking about the 75th anniversary of Black Boy from Richard Wright. Um, that panel should be just fabulous and, and really powerful. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Of course, we talked last week at length about the relationship between Margaret Walker and Richard Wright. So that may come up uh, as well. And the other one that we've been tied to through the Margaret Walker Center uh, for our work for the better part of the past 18 months is around the new book that is out about the 1970 Jackson State shootings um, by Dr. Nancy Bristow. Um, and it is fabulous. It's published by Oxford University Press, and she is giving uh, a talk, moderated conversation, also with Professor Seeley McInnes. Um, so those two in particular for the book festival, I would encourage you to, to log on to. Um, as last week, um, we started by just discussing Margaret and her life, um, bringing her up to really 1949 and her arrival in Jackson. And so I want to uh, start there again and uh, share with you um, some thoughts um, and some uh, some images from our vaults um, related to, to Margaret's life and what's going on, especially at the time of her um, publication of Jubilee in 1966. Um, we mentioned also showed this slide last week that when we uh, when Margaret arrived, so this to advance. There we go. Um, when Margaret arrived in Jackson in 1949, uh, she came by herself. She left her family behind. Her husband and two uh, older children stayed in North Carolina. Her two younger children went to stay with their parents. And she comes to this world of Jackson, Mississippi, on a one-year appointment at Jackson State, um, not sure whether she's going to be able to stay longer or not. Um, she kept a diary, a journal for 60 years, it's 13,000 handwritten pages, all of which are in our collections at the Margaret Walker Center, all of which are digitized too. You can go to our website and you can browse through Margaret's journals. But in her journal, when she comes to Jackson State, she says, I'm really nervous about this job. I really hope I can stay here at least four or five years. And of course, she ends up staying at Jackson State for the rest of her career. She spends 30 years on the faculty from 1949 to 1979 at Jackson State. Um, and the rest of her life in Jackson until the day she dies in 1998. And when she moves for our purposes, especially um, with the Welty House, um, she moves just four miles away from Eudora Welty, um, exactly four miles away, um, very close uh, to each other. And yet Margaret was coming into, in 1949 in Jackson, a racist <laughs> segregationist world um, that could be just as misogynist at times as racist, um, but really was, it was a revolutionary move for this woman who was incredibly well educated with her master's degree um, from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, her master be, master's thesis being her great collection of poetry for my people in the poem by the same name. Um, and just for her to come to Mississippi in that context in 1949 is, a particularly powerful move in the fact that she stayed here for the rest of, of her life, I think is, is one that we should note. And being a segregated world, she and Wilty aren't friends at first. They don't know each other. Margaret is not um, exactly invited into Belhaven or into um, kind of the upper echelon of white social circles in 1949. Uh, and this is going to be later in life when before Welty and, and Walker will become friends. And they will. And they'll go on speaking tours together. And there's lots of great images. I'll show some next time of Margaret and, and Eudora uh, together. Um, but this context of Jackson, Mississippi in 1949, really at the outset of the modern civil rights movement at a time when particularly Black World War II veterans are asserting their rights to American citizenship after having fought Nazism and fascism at home. Uh, and that includes one of Margaret's neighbors on what was then called Gine Street. This map is a modern map. The street's now named for Margaret, Margaret Walker Alexander. We talked about this last time, so I'll just uh, repeat it here real quickly. Alexander was her married name, which she used professionally at Jackson State. People knew her as Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander. 
she used her maiden name for her entire literary career. Everything she ever published, even after um, she was long after she was married, she published under the name Margaret Walker. So you'll hear us at the center kind of switch back and forth between the two and use both. But the street today is Margaret Walker Alexander Drive. Back then it was Gine Street. And Gine Street, uh, sh just a few short years um, after Margaret moved there uh, and moved into what was considered the nicest house on the street, the only two story house. It was a double lot. She had a huge garden in the back of her house. But a few uh, years after Margaret moved uh, there, Medgar and Merle Evers moved to Gine Street and would be close uh, family friends and, and neighbors uh, of Margaret Walker's. Medgar being the World War II veteran who, along with his brother Charles Evers, would attempt to go vote wearing their World War II uniforms and would be turned away by a white mob in Mississippi. Really one of those moments that is going to seal his consciousness and, and bring him into the the modern movement. Um, and I love this picture of the Gine Street Garden Club. Um, so some of you know Dr. Mabel Pittman. She's fourth from the left um, and is still with us. Uh, in the middle, directly behind the punch bowl, that is Merle Evers. And second from the right is, is Margaret Walker. I just, I love this picture replete with uh, petty fours and all the things that a garden club um, would be known for at the time. Um, of course, Medgar's life would come to a tragic end when he is assassinated uh, in 1963 uh, in his driveway, as all of you well know. And I think it's important for us uh, to understand this is Margaret's neighbor, her close family friend. Their kids grew up together. They played together. Um, they knew each other incredibly well. And in 1963, when Medgar is assassinated on the street Margaret lives on, she is actually at the University of Iowa working on her dissertation, um, finishing her PhD uh, in the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and her dissertation was Jubilee. Um, and it would eventually be published in 1966. So when Medgar is assassinated, we give, I think, a lot of, of, of credit to Eudora Welty, particularly for where is the voice coming from. But that moment for Margaret is an intensely personal one, as you can imagine. And not only does Medgar live on the same street as Margaret at the, at the time of his assassination, um, the NAACP offices to this day are on John R. Lynch Street, right beside the Jackson State campus. And so his funeral procession, Medgar's funeral procession, will go down the middle of John R. Lynch Street. Um, so he lived and worked on the same street as Margaret. And so you can imagine the impact that had on her. Uh, and again, a place that if you're interested, you can go into her journals and dig more into kind of her, her thoughts about what it meant to have Medgar um, taken from her. But this is 1963, right? You've had the, the Freedom Rides, uh, you had the 1960 sit-ins. In 1963, you have the Woolworths sit-in in downtown Jackson, which is considered you know, by, by many people one of the most um, notorious uh, sit-ins where Ann Moody, Joan Trumpower, Mulholland, John Salter, a group of Tougaloo students, and a handful of others are assaulted by a white mob made up of mostly young white high school students from nearby Central High School. This is the year in which Margaret is at the University of Iowa finishing uh, her dissertation um, that would become Jubilee. Out of Margaret's despair over Medgar's death, she would publish not just Medgar's but other um, civil rights martyrs as well, a collection of poetry called Prophets for a New Day in which she used biblical prophets as metaphors for civil rights martyrs and activists. Micah was her Medgar Evers and this is um, of all of her poems, this is my personal favorite um, poem uh, of uh, Margaret's um, published uh, with Prophets for a New Day in 1970. Micah was a young man of the people who came up from the streets of Mississippi and cried out his vision to his people, who stood fearless before the waiting throng like an astronaut shooting into space. Micah was a man who spoke against oppression, crying, woe to you workers on iniquity, crying, woe to you doers of violence, crying, woe to you breakers of the peace, crying, woe to you, my enemy. For when I fall, I shall rise in deathless dedication. When I stagger on the wound of your paid assassins, I shall be whole again in deathless triumph. For your rich men are full of violence and your mayors of your city speak lies. They are full of deceit. We do not fear them. 
they shall not enter the city of goodwill. We shall dwell under our vine and fig tree in peace, and they shall not be remembered in the book of life. Micah was a man. I think from, you get a sense of what um, the loss of Medgar uh, and that tragedy meant to Margaret uh, in this piece. Uh, and, and again, I would encourage you to check out the entire collection um, of Micah, uh, of Prophets for a New Day, including Micah. So uh, she'll finish her dissertation at the University of Iowa, and three years later in 1966, Jubilee will be published. Again, I'm, I'm a civil rights historian by training, so let us remember the context within which this is being published. 1966, Mississippi. This is published three years after Medgar has been assassinated on the street she lives on, three years after Medgar's funeral procession goes down the middle of the street uh, that she works on. It is very a, a reality that when Margaret publishes Jubilee in 1966, she's taking her life into her own hands. Y'all have read it. You, the opening scene of Margaret's very real great, great grandmother dying in childbirth from being repeatedly raped by her master. This is a searing story and, um, uh, and a searing uh, critique of white supremacy and the white American South. And so to publish Jubilee in 1966, living in Jackson, Mississippi, and I would point out 1966, also being the year of James Meredith's March Against Fear, right? When Meredith attempts to march from Memphis to Jackson and on second day of his march, he'll get shot in the back, um, attempting to show black Mississippians that they should register to vote after the arrival of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. When the March Against Fear finally arrives in Jackson, it's the single uh, largest protest in the history of the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi when it reaches downtown, estimated upwards of 30,000 people. And I would note this summer being the, the second largest and the largest since 1966 with the Black Lives Matter protest that was in downtown Jackson. She publishes this in the same year as the March Against Fear. Of note also is the fact that during the March Against Fear, Willie Ricks and Stokely Carmichael of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, will coin the term black power. Black power is coined in Mississippi. It's coined as a means of claiming the right to autonomy and, 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 and self-determination and, and fundamental human dignity. I don't wanna get into black power too much because I, I think it's widely misinterpreted and misunderstood, um, but the, it was a very significant change moment for the modern civil rights movement. And it's in that context that Margaret is publishing Jubilee uh, in 1966. Uh, and you can see the original um, cover design here. And so uh, continuing in her revolutionary kind of streak, right, um, that, that was Margaret Walker and very much taking her life into her own hands publishing Jubilee. Jubilee is based on the memories of her grandmother, um, who is the character of Minna in the story. Um, Minna, the, 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 the real life woman, um, and you can see, uh, here's a copy, uh, a picture of Margaret signing copies of Jubilee in 1966 on campus at Jackson State. Um, some of you, again, uh, you saw Mabel Pittman earlier in that um, picture of the Guy Street Garden Club. She's here again with her daughter getting a copy of Jubilee signed. And then uh, a signing that was at Lenox Square in Atlanta um, later that year uh, in 1966. Let me note here too, I mentioned of course that Margaret came into a sexist and misogynistic world as well as a racist one. The president of Jackson State, Jacob Reddix, would not allow Margaret Walker any leave to go on a book tour um, when Jubilee is published in 1966, something that she took very personally and for a uh, good reason. Uh, and you can also read more about that in her um, journals. But back to Minna, the character Minna uh, was Margaret's very real grandmother uh, who lived with her in New Orleans growing up and told her the stories, the initial stories that are going to become Jubilee. It is a true story about her, uh, Margaret's grandmother and her great grandmother. Um, and these are the real women. Um, Minna, uh, the character Elvira Ware Dozier, 
if you know Minna's real name, Elvira Ware Dozier, is where uh, Margaret gets the name Viree from. Um, she actually uses Viree to describe her great grandmother, uh, but it was uh, her grandmother's actual name. And then Viree herself here, Margaret Duggins Ware Brown. Remember the, the main male characters in the story, Randall Ware and Ennis Brown, right? These are real people. Um, and so the names um, are very much uh, real uh, as well. And for our purposes in our conversation, I would just note that when you get to the part of Jubilee where Viree is able to pass as white, which really you see that kind of coming up over and over again over the course of the book, in real life, she could pass, right? Um, this is uh, the, the real woman. Interestingly, Minna, Elvira Ware Dozier, Margaret's grandmother who lived with her, telling her these stories, Margaret's parents hated that she was telling Margaret these stories. They did not want her telling. You can imagine they're going, why are you telling our small daughter these horrifying stories? Um, and Elvira Ware Dozier simply stood by it and was like, she needs to know her history. She needs to know what happened. She needs to be informed and she needs uh, to be educated. Um, and so um, these images are, are incredibly special in the fact that um, that we have captured um, these very real women who are, you know, some of the, the, the bravest women by Rhea in particular, um, and perhaps in American literary uh, history, although we can talk more too about the criticism Margaret received for writing by Rhea the way she did, and um, for what are some seemingly conservative decision making uh, that Viri makes over the course um, of the novel. Uh, and of course, Jubilee is going to be a major literary success. It's going to win the, the Houghton Mifflin Prize uh, in 1966, and it's going to establish a genre of fiction known as neo-slave narratives or neo-slave novels, where for the very first time you have popular fiction being published from the perspective of enslaved people themselves, and obviously what you believe from the perspective of, of enslaved women uh, themselves. And, and that's going to include a long list of, of books that you know quite well. Um, Toni Morrison, right, Beloved, um, and uh, also Alex Haley's Roots. And here's a picture of Alex Haley with Nick Aaron Ford and Margaret Walker uh, on the Jackson State campus giving a talk. For Margaret, who was at one time um, friends with Alex Haley, Roots is going to be way too similar uh, to Jubilee for her tastes. Um, and in fact, if you go through the diaries, there are about, oh, 10 or 12 pages, single spaced handwritten pages where she details um, all the places within which Alex Haley plagiarized um, Jubilee in Roots. Now, Alex Haley um, is going to settle several lawsuits for plagiarism of Roots out of court. And Margaret is going to sue him as well for plagiarism. And she's going to lose that lawsuit. I would suggest to you that she loses not necessarily because she was wrong, um, but because he had better lawyers, um, just plain and simple and could afford better lawyers. Um, it, it was another one of these moments of being really assaulted by black men in Margaret's life. Richard Wright, I mentioned Jacob Reddix, the president of Jackson State, Alex Haley, moments that wound Margaret in very intense ways. Um, and so this, this whole connection, right, the, the intersectionality uh, of, of race, racism, and misogyny, and sexism are really an important part of Margaret's life. Uh, just one other anecdotal story. Um, a number of years ago, before he passed away, Amiri Baraka, formerly Leroy Jones, the writer and poet, um, came to Jackson State to give a lecture and he proceeded to tell me a story about Margaret was famous for hosting people at her house for dinners and, and bringing them in to, um, for, for social uh, events. Um, and her house was this uh, epicenter of black literary and artistic life in Mississippi. And Mary Baraka was invited over to her house one time, and he said when he walked into her home and walked into the foyer of the, her home, right by the front door on a little pedestal, was a copy of Jubilee and a copy of Roots, and Margaret had highlighted all of the passages that Alex Haley had plagiarized for everybody to see whenever they came into her house. Um, so she certainly didn't let um, people uh, forget it either. Um, so with that, um, I'll, I'll stop there um, and perhaps we can um, 
jump into the conversation. However, um, whatever people feel like talking about, there's any number of topics I'd be interested in, particularly uh, in this section. We will, when we come back next week, I'll, re I'll return to a little bit of Margaret's bio and talk more kind of about her later life and the work that we do at the Margaret Walker Center. Um, and I see Angela Stewart uh, in the chat, who is our archivist at the Margaret Walker Center, uh, mentions a scrapbook we have um, that Margaret kept of those similarities between Jubilee and Roots. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll stop there and perhaps we can jump in the conversation. I don't know if there's anything that um, people feel particularly motivated to talk about in this section on the Civil War uh, in particular. Uh, I know one of the things Lauren mentioned to me as we were jumping on that's interesting from the first section to the second, um, Vyrie is not nearly as visible in part two um, of the story as she is in part one. I don't know how people um, uh, feel about that, but yeah, let's jump into it. So questions, thoughts? I see one question here from uh, Katie Pabilski about how she decided to write a novel uh, as that a historical novel as opposed to an epic poem or a series of poems. Uh, she was a prolific uh, poet uh, as well. And we do have epic poems that she wrote in our collections. Um, you know, the novel was something that was in her mind for the better part of 30 years um, from the time her, uh, her grandmother began telling her the stories as a young child. Um, up through um, researching and, and the intense research. I hope you can tell in this book that the historical research that went into it, the, the accuracies, even especially in this section, I think it's interesting. Um, I'm not much of one to study Civil War battles. Margaret studied Civil War battles. She knew what was happening. She knew the battlefields, right? She understood the, the details um, of the history. Um, and so it was something that was in the works for Margaret for, for many years. Um, and interestingly, this was her only novel. Um, although we have a couple of unpublished novels in our collections, one of which we're working on um, getting out um, as an annotated um, piece with a friend and, and scholar of ours at Augusta University, a uh, friend of ours and scholar at Augusta University. So thanks, Katie. And I see Lynn has her hand raised and Harriet did a, a little bit ago as well. It's my turn. Sure. Um, I was going to ask about the very thing you were just talking about was the uh, historic research in this novel. So it, uh, where, how did she get all that information? Well, where was she, where was she going to find all this? Because I, the, the stuff I've read, it, it wasn't, it was, it was actually difficult to, to get real good information about what was going on during the Civil War. She spent 30 years researching and writing it, um, and she actually went to these places. Um, she went to Georgia and found Randall Ware's old smithy um, and was able to verify that he, in fact, was a blacksmith in, in this part of, of southwest Georgia. So she spent a lot of time on the road, a lot of time in archives, and, and doing very real historical research, which is also one of the reasons I feel very comfortable teaching it in my history classes at Jackson State, because really Really the only thing that's fictional in it particularly is the dialogue, right? The stories are true. They happen. We know the people are real. Um, and and the, 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 the facts of the story um, are real as well. And so um, it, it's great to teach historical themes, um, uh, especially for this era, right? And I know Harriet had a question too. Yeah. Um, I you know, I'm thinking about, I'm finding it really interesting to think about the intersection between this being biographical and the fact that this section of the novel at least uh, really plays on tropes of the plantation novel. Um, and um, I'm trying, I'm, I'm uh, I, I, so they're certainly played with a difference. Um, you know, I think about a writer like Charles Chesnut who plays, plays the the tropes, but does it in a way that undermines uh, the meaning uh, of, the, of the plantation novel tropes. But the presentation of the, um, uh, the outrageous mistress, the, um, the, um, uh, the master who is, uh, uh, is, um, is kinder, perhaps, uh, uh, the, the uh, vision of the, um, uh, the slave, uh, the, 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 um, the slave driver, um, 
the uh, presentation of the faithful servants, um, who I'm thinking of Sam and Jim and Bari, who all um, uh, are, are loyal um, to people that they know and care about. Um, and um, what, I, what I would say what in my thoughts so far is that um, what the novel gives us that takes us out of the realm of plantation novel is the thoughts of those slaves at the same time that they are making the choices that they are, uh, the thoughts of uh, needing to needing to not to not not continue in this situation, the need for freedom. Um, uh, but I wondered if you thought about that too, and if you had uh, other thoughts about um, how she's manipulating uh, uh, familiar tropes to do something uh, original. Yeah, um, she's definitely trying to uh, to change the narrative. One of the things that drives me nuts to hear is when people say this is the black version of Gone with the Wind. It, it is not that at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you heard that before, Harry? <laughs> Um, people people come up to me and, and 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 say that on a fairly frequent basis. She is exploding all of the mythology of Gone with the Wind in this book um, for sure, um, and you definitely have these um, these characters. Uh, the thing I would add is that you know Missy Salina, John Morris Dutton, these also were real people, right? And the stories that she tells about them are stories that were told to her um, by her grandmother, um, and and yet she does get criticism. Um, for uh, for Vyrie. Um, and, and as people around her, Vyrie, are, are leaving the plantation and uh, um, are really asserting their claims to freedom. And this is uh, something that I talk quite a bit about in my history classes, that somehow Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln didn't just free the slaves. Enslaved people were freeing themselves, right? They, they were fighting for freedom. They were, as you see with Randall Ware, they're joining um, the, the Union Army. They're becoming US colored troops. They're running away in droves. They are leaving the plantation. And yet in the midst of all of that, Byrie stays. And Byrie takes care of this white family that had been so horrid to her. Now, she had different kind of feelings for Lillian than she did, right, who's her half-sister, than she did for the other members um, of the family. Um, but, um, but the fact that Vyrie stays is a point of contention for a lot of people in that period, particularly Black writers. We're in the midst in 1966 of really the, the, the beginning of what's considered the Black Arts Movement, right, which is, is a product of the modern civil rights movement. And these artists and writers want a more radical character than what um, uh, Margaret gives us in Vyrie. I see Beverly asking if Kevin was a real person who was anti-war, anti-Confederacy. I actually, I don't know the answer to that. I'm guessing she was. Maybe Miss Stewart knows whether Kevin was real or not. Um, but he certainly plays a foil, right, uh, to uh, the other uh, characters in the book, um, particularly Johnny Dutton, right, um, uh, who who is um, one of the many people who were killed, and 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 the Dutton family over the course of this section, right they are decimated. I mean, Margaret just takes a, a scythe to them and just chops them all, all off at the knees in this section. I wonder if anybody felt badly for any of the Duttons as what happens to them over the course of this. I see people saying no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't particularly either. <laughs> and Molly has her hand up. Molly, I wonder if you have something to say about that or maybe a previous topic. Oh, you're still on mute. Hi, sorry, and I have a baby who might be That's eating. okay. I don't have anything to say about any of that, but I do want to say that as I've been reading the book, I love the little verses and poems that start every chapter. And I'm curious if you know anything about Margaret's writing process. Um, you know, those poems really seem to shape the chapters. And I'm wondering if she found them like after the fact, or if they were kind of helping to inform some of the gaps. Uh, a little bit of both, right? So some come after the fact as she's trying to, to fill them in and others are pieces that she's gathered over time that she realizes inspires um, uh, her, um, 
and, and, and each chapter, and you're right, they, they have this great role of um, helping to um, transition, right, from, from one chapter into another. And it also represents Margaret's love of, of, of poetry, of, of folklore and folk tales. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's some combination of the two. So yeah, thanks for that, Molly. I felt like it made the novel stronger, the uh, sympathetic way she portrays the white family and the white people, as well as the slaves. I, and I wonder if any other work of literature has ever done that, side by side, the both side by side. When, when you say sympathetic, what do you mean, Alec? Well, I could feel the way John Morris Dutton was feeling. Um, I could well understand and the, the way Missy Salina was, her, her feelings. Uh, to me, those are realistically portrayed uh, characters. Well, and as brutal as Salina was, I argue that she also was a victim in this story. She was a, a victim of, of her husband's, um, you know, just cheating on her and, and the, the, the psychological toil uh, toll that that's going to take on Salina. I think is a real one also for, and, uh, and I see Lynn put, isn't the decimation of the family just pretty realistic? The, yeah, I mean, the Civil War was right, decimated the white South in, in, in general and very, in ways very much similar to um, what happens in this story, but also um, very realistic in the sense that Salina isn't the only white woman in the South who's dealing with this, right? And who, right. And, and whose response um, is to to meet her own misery um, and 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 her her own pain with brutality. And white women could be notoriously brutal um, yeah. when it came, particularly to the illegitimate offspring of their husbands. Yeah, yeah. Robbie, going back to the, the epigraphs at the beginning of each novel, I, I read somewhere that um, Margaret Walker considered this as much of uh, a novel that was representative of folkways as it was a historical novel. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting that she had dedicated so much of her life to understanding folkways and incorporated that in this novel. I know um, Jessica and I were talking last week about some of the medicinal plant knowledge that's in this book that's just absolutely stunning that she would have, you know, I'm not sure if she did found that in her research or if she learned that from her grandmother, but um, it really adds a lot to this novel as a whole, I think. Yeah, another place where she did a lot of research and they would have been stories, but there's no way that Margaret would have known the details of all of that as a child being told to her, right, by her grandmother. So she had to research that as well. And you're right, and you're going to see the folkways um, come up particularly in the third section uh, as she and Ennis are trying to make a life uh, together through, again, repeated tragedy in Byrie's life. And you almost get to the point you're like, you wonder if it will ever end for Byrie. Like, is the is there ever going to be something good um, that uh, that happens to her? But yes, folkways are an incredibly important part uh, of the story, and also part of. Um, you know, I talk uh, often about power and who has power, and, and folkways were ways in which enslaved people and African Americans were able to claim some small um, piece of power and control of their lives. Right, those, yeah. those medicines and 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 other things. Elizabeth, I see you have your hand raised. Oh, you're still muted. Can okay, you're still muted, Elizabeth. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, the idea that the Union comes sweeping in and they're the great saviors and free the slaves in the scene in this book where the Union general stands on the porch and reads this, tells the slaves they're all free. And then the place is destroyed, trashed by the, by the uh, soldiers. It is the most graphic portrayal of just callous hate almost. I, I stood the, as I read that, I thought, my gosh, you're not left with one thing to eat. It's, it's really horrible. And um, 
in school you say, well, you know, there was Sherman's March to the Sea, but you don't really see the, the kind of destruction that is portrayed here. And I think it's very, very powerful in terms of people thinking about the war. There were no good guys or bad guys. It was a bad war. <laughs> it just was hard. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things I was left with when I was looking at that scene. A, a very another very realistic portrayal of what war was like right yeah and, yeah and, and, yeah. and part of that too was the attempt by the union army to wage war against the capacity of the south to continue to resist yeah yeah, um, yeah. and and so attacking the sources of mm -hmm. of, of of how you fight you know mm -hmm. the, the, um and and also um Desertion is going to be a huge problem for the Confederacy, and you can see in in these images why poor whites, in particular, are going to, are going to just leave the Confederate Army uh, mm -hmm. and come back. But it's certainly we can't um, romanticize war, right? Uh, it, it is brutal, um, and and there's certainly you know white Northerners could be just as racist as white Southerners, and um, mm -hmm. And, and just as, as brutal, for sure. Mm -hmm. Elta, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, I was interested in the question that Dr. Luckett poses about the role of religion in the novel. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me, because of that question, then I started to think about it, that with the slaves, the mixture of the African and of course, it's Moses. It's not Jesus. It's Moses, right. the liberator, um, and that they that they pray to come, that there'll be uh, someone to come and free them. And then with the with the white family, it's used as a as as a prop. It's a hypocritical. Uh, they only call on it when they can use it for some sort of hypocritical purpose. Um, and I was wondering what you were trying to get at with your question about the role of religion. Yeah, very, very much that and how particularly for the white South, um, religion is used as a means of constructing race. And we talked last time um, about this idea and you all understand it. I know the, the social constructiveness of things like race and um, uh, gender, right, sexual identity, um, class, um, but that how religion is used as a tool um, to, to reinforce white power and white supremacy. Um, and yet for, uh, even though white folks are trying to get enslaved people to absorb that uh, form of white Christianity and white religion, black folks are taking it on their, <laughs> on their own terms and turning it into what they want to turn it into. Um, and as you mentioned, and as we talked about last time, looking at Moses as, as the great uh, hero and liberator um, of the Bible and not specifically Jesus. Um, I like to say in my classes, we often assume that enslaved people were all deaf, right? And that they couldn't hear um, and that they, you know, they couldn't ha somehow think on their own and take what they were hearing and, and have their own interpretations. Um, and, and the role too of the black preacher right, um, and Brother Zeke uh, in uh, Jubilee um, as a source of power. Um, and, and Ezekiel may be the single most powerful um, black person in, in the story, right? Um, at least throughout, um, up, up to the point that he dies. Um, uh, he, he is uh, key to liberating um, people before the war, um, key to spying on the South and the Confederacy during the war. Um, and so, yes, um, r religion um, plays many roles therein. So I see Alec has his hand up again. I don't know if anybody else does. I wondered why the white people didn't kill Zeke, because uh, he was right powerful and right accomplished, both before and after liberation. And so uh, I wonder if a person that accomplished could survive. Uh, yeah, um, because he was smarter than they were. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's also a common uh, trope. They, they uh, white people assumed that, um, that, that black people like Brother Zeke couldn't, you know, deceive them, that somehow they knew exactly what he was up to all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And they just didn't. And, and there are Brother Zekes throughout African-American and American history. Um, 
that's um, uh, th that is evident. And and look, he took his life into his own hand plenty of times, and he and and there were people like him who could have been caught at any point, right? And and would have been put to death immediately, especially if their their role on the Underground Railroad um, had been uh, discovered. Um, but they they were smart and you know the things like the underground railroad um uh, despite the fact that i had an undergraduate once right on his midterm that it was an actual operating train system that ferried slaves to freedom much like uh, the modern subway system um it wasn't uh and um uh it, it was this really secret informal network of people that was you weren't connected more than one or two people down the line to each other right and so one person was one link in, in a chain and and that was very intentional uh in terms of um uh, of protecting the the conductors the people who were involved in it so uh i'd like to ask a question hey dr uh, hi dr luckett how did you get so involved in uh, wanting to be a Margaret Walker scholar, and <laughs> particularly, you know, focusing on, you know, I mean, this is like a lifetime kind of endeavor. Uh, you know so much, and it's wonderful to hear all the information you have, but when and how did you get involved? Well, I mean, I, be, I've been working on Margaret Walker every day of my life for the past 12 years. So I've been eating, breathing, sleeping Margaret Walker, um, of course, as you well know, as director of the Margaret Walker Center. Um, and um, I, it came to me with the job at Jackson State when I was appointed um, to the history department with a tenure track position back then and as jointly as director of the Margaret Walker Center. When I came to Jackson State 12 years ago, I knew Margaret Walker, I knew Jubilee, I knew For My People, but I certainly didn't know much about Margaret Walker or, um, or these things. Certainly, I didn't know as much then when I came here as you did, Dr. Derby. Um, and I would just say, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Derby spent time on Margaret's staff at what was then the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People. And we have a lovely picture. Dr. Derby, maybe I'll pull that picture up for next week um, when we gather uh, you and the other staff members together with Margaret, um, maybe in 1969 or 1970, something along those lines. Well, interesting enough, um, the photograph that you have of uh, Margaret with uh, Alex Haley Mm. sitting at the table. Right. Well, if you look on the right hand side of that picture, I'm pretty sure that is me, the back, okay. my back, because that dress is one that I made of African material um, that, uh, yeah, that's my dress. It's, I brought that material back from Nigeria and I made that dress. I'm pretty sure that's me. So I don't know if you have any other photographs of that, that event, but it would be very interesting to see. I actually donated that, that dress to the um, Mississippi Archives Department because it's my camera dress. I, I made it with two big pockets in the front to carry my lens and my uh, wallet uh, when I was taking photographs. Well, I thought you were going to say you took that picture, which wouldn't have surprised me either, Dr. Derby, <laughs> knowing, knowing you. So that's a, a great story. And um, I will tell everyone here as well, uh, in addition to um, the pro all the programming we had planned for the 50th commemoration uh, of the Gibbs Green tragedy, the shootings at Jackson State, we have a remarkable exhibit of Dr. Derby's photographs um, from that time that is waiting to be installed as soon as anybody can actually be back on our campus. Um, and so we will have a, a fabulous exhibit um, of Dr. Derby's photographs going up um, in the not too distant future. So. Actually, that dress is in the uh, Civil Rights Museum, now that I think about it. It's in the display case with artifacts uh, that uh, relating to my photography and uh, different uh, Liberty House handcrafts and other uh, archival documents yeah. in the uh, book, the case at the, at the museum. I, I noticed Ms. Stewart, our archivist, said that Roy Lewis took that photograph. Roy Lewis is a famous, um, as Dr. Derby knows, and many of you might, um, famous um, photographer 
um, who just incredibly prolific, just like Dr. Derby, and is still alive and well and uh, in the Washington DC area. So he, he, if we called Roy Lewis, I bet he might be able to find more of those, uh, more of those pictures, Dr. Derby. Okay, great. Sorry, to, <laughs> we got a little bit of sidetracked there, but um, I, so I'm, I'm wondering if anybody was upset by the fact that Vyrie didn't leave the plantation and that she stayed. Did that bother anybody? It certainly bothered people at the time um, and other since. Lynn, you have your hand raised. And then I see Laura Wilson has her hand up as well. Um, why don't you let Laura go first because I have a question about something else. Oh, well, I mean, <clears throat> I've been doing um, some work on reconstruction um, and kind of how that panned out or didn't. Um, and um, I think kind of to look back at that period, um, just there are, you know, reasons to be disappointed in the decision for many enslaved individuals to stay. But also I think you have to consider the failure of preparation, you know, what economic opportunities were available, what alternatives were there. And, um, you know, so uh, I'll be interested to see in part three, kind of what becomes of Vairi, uh going forward into the reconstruction period of how the, um, like the newly emancipated life um, kind of pr progresses, you know? Um, so I think that that has to be taken into consideration in thinking why people chose to stay on the plantation, at least for some time. Well, and this is a theme that's gonna come back in part three. There's going to be another moment where Vyrie has a choice to make. Um, and she, for some of us and for others, uh, may not make the choice that you would like to see her make. Um, and of course, the same thing happened in part one, right? Um, she um, decides when she has the opportunity to run away with Randall Ware, it, she's not able to, right? Um, and she makes that decision not to leave her children behind and to try and take them with her. And so here we are uh, again uh, at a, a point where uh, Vyrie, through Margaret, writing Vyrie, makes this choice um, to stay. I, I would point out here, too, that, um, that, that while it is, of course, biographical, um, uh, uh, Margaret herself and her home life um, makes a choice, a seemingly conservative choice, to get married, to, to have a family, to, to raise that family and take a settled teaching job and to move to Jackson, Mississippi, where she is going to stay for the next 49 years, right? From 1949 to 1998. Um, and so there may also, I might suggest, be um, some um, of Margaret uh, appearing in Vyrie as well and in Vyrie's decision-making. Um, because there certainly was a moment, especially in 1942, when For My People hits and becomes this, this major thing with the Yale Younger Poets Prize, um, there's a moment when Margaret could have made very different choices with her life, um, particularly from an, an artistic perspective. Um, there's a, a great picture in 42 of her with Langston Hughes at the, um, I think I showed it last time, at Yaddo, uh, the upstate, famous upstate writing retreat in, in New York. Um, and, and included in that image are folks, it's Langston Hughes, it's Margaret, it's also Carson McCullers, and, and just a, an incredible group. Margaret makes a fairly conservative choice, and she does um, relish, particularly later in life, the role of being kind of the, the, the mother, the, the homemaker, the kind of the domesticated figure in a way that may be more conservative than we might expect or, or some people might want, but... Anyways, that's a long way of saying that that the decision making in Byrie is a theme in the book and it comes back and it'll come back to us in the third part. And perhaps it's also reflected in um, Margaret herself in her own life. And I saw that Elta, you might have raised your hand in response to this question and then we can always jump back to your 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 question, Lynn. Robbie. Yeah, hey Suzanne. 
running away was no uh, guarantee that you were going to succeed. I mean, the, no. ch the chances were highly likely that you would fail and be subjected to horrible uh, treatment as a result, death. Yep. Yeah. So isn't that, I mean, she's making a decision with that in, in her mind. Yeah, for sure. And even if she had left, you know, the, look, the, the, the caravans of formerly enslaved people who are following Union troops around the South are often desperate places. The, these were not just kind of, you know, joyous celebrations of freedom that would follow these Union. They, these were, were people who were often starving, right? Who were certainly risking a lot uh, in terms of their own lives just to, to, to leave the plantation. And, and still their masters considered them enslaved. So if they had been caught by a white person uh, who knew them leaving at the time, they also um, would have faced death. I think the, the part that, that's tempting in the book um, is that one, very clearly, um, Randall Ware survives, um, and the fact that he survives makes us think that that Viri would have survived as well, right? But there's some, you, you're like, well, if Randall made it, of course he knew that he was going to be able to get her to freedom. Why didn't she, she go with him? And then when Ennis Brown shows up in this section on the Civil War, um, he very clearly saves her, protects her, but yet she refuses to leave for the longest time. Now, she does eventually, and even before she meets Ennis Brown, she stays because she, she's somehow waiting because she believes Randall Ware uh, is going to, to come back. Um, and so I guess there, there's this, uh, this idea, and of course it's fiction, so Margaret could have written it however she wanted to write it, um, she, that uh, Vyrie could have survived. I, I would just suggest that particularly in the context of the black arts movement, there were other writers at that time, um, black writers in particular, who criticized Margaret for not writing a more radical character. Elta and Harriet and then Lynn. I was going to say that, it, you know, in my opinion, she, Vyrie didn't really have a choice. She wasn't making a choice because of having to uh, leave her children. And given the character and the vindictiveness and the hatred uh, of Big Missy, you know, she was never going to, those children, uh, and, and she fully understood what it was like not to have a mother there to protect her. And so I, I don't see, I mean, that was just between a rock and a hard place. She would have had to have been willing to literally sacrifice her children had she, had she left them. Yeah, thanks. Another there were others. I was going to say, um, I was going to say, am I muted? No. I, uh, I, that um, more surprising, I think, than her staying to wait for Randall Ware and to, um, to show some concern for the woman who is her half sister and her, and her children and her own children and the problem of not knowing what to do next. Um, more surprising is her leading Lucy to this family stash of wealth. Um, and uh, I wondered, uh, I, mean, I, this is, uh, um, I don't know the, the Walker criticism, I wondered uh, how that gets discussed. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, she, she is clear about her not wanting to be labeled a thief and that she would, um, uh, it, it, she would have been outed eventually by the, by the children. Um, but that's an interesting uh, uh, moment. Yeah, another one of those that Margaret's going to get criticized for writing that, that way um, because they're just people who wanted Byrie to make a different decision and at that point um, than what she did. Yeah, that that is a, a remarkable moment when she could have certainly made a very different decision and probably gotten away with a lot more than what she did. I feel like, Margaret, I, I feel like that criticism is unfair, though, because to me it seems different than what Margaret Walker might have thought it was what her character thought because she there is that moment where she sees one of the freed slaves with all of the food and the woman says I bought this with my life or something to that extent um so you see the the two kind of ways of viewing that 
Yeah, there's the woman who comes along with the cart and she's got this cart just piled up with everything she could possibly stick on it. And I think it's one of the Union soldiers asks her where she's going or where'd you get all of that? And she said, I, I bought it with my life. Yeah, um, you certainly have that as, as a contrast there for sure. Lynn, I think you still have your hand raised. Thanks for waiting. You're welcome. I wanted you to talk a little bit more, Robbie, about Randall Ware, because he was such a fascinating character to me. And it's it's wonderful to know that he actually had a black smith shop and how, you know, you, you've seen a character like that in other books that I've read, but he has a, a real personality. And it does seem like it was a terribly dangerous for him to live there. Uh, if at any moment he basically could have been enslaved again, captured and kidnapped and enslaved again. Well, it's one of the reasons he has to leave because the state of Georgia passes a law that basically kicks out all uh, free black people. Um, and so when he leaves, he's forced to. And it is, Randall Ware is very much a real person. He, um, and there's a whole, uh, in, in section three, there's a whole nother story about, of course, um, radical Republican coalitions are going to pop up across the South immediately following the Civil War, including in, in Mississippi, right, where um, they're going to write in 1868 uh, a state constitution in Mississippi that I, I'd argue is one of the most progressive political documents in American history. It's very fascinating to go back and look at the 1868 Mississippi Constitution. Um, and, uh, and the same thing in Georgia. And Randall Ware would be a delegate to, and you'll see this pop up in the third part, um, a delegate to the Georgia Constitutional Convention um, and, and will be participating in that. So um, yes, Rand Randall Ware is, in, in many ways, he's everything Viree isn't, <laughs> right? He's making all of the decisions that Viree doesn't make. Um, and, um, and, and he is just this, this different kind of angel sitting on her shoulder, um, trying uh, to, to do something very different. And it, it's amazing that Randall Ware survives, um, this story because he certainly, along with brother Zeke, um, he, he is an expression of power in a way, um, that is, is very real. We're at 12.58, so um, Robbie, if there's anything you want to wrap us up with before we, we hit our hour mark. Well, this has been fun. Again, it goes by so quickly. Um, I look forward to being back with everybody next week and, and closing out um, this third uh, section of Jubilee on Reconstruction. Um, and we'll come back and share a little bit more of Margaret's story, tell you a little bit more about her, her later years and the institute that I now run that she founded in 1968 uh, and, and look forward to, to jumping into that. There are uh, more questions uh, available for you to look at that I've posed to my own students um, as part of the discussion, but I look forward to, to where this goes um, from here. So thank you, Dr. Luckett. Thank you so much, everyone, for your really insightful comments and discussion, and we'll see you next week. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.